Well, a number of years ago, one of our boys, who was about six years old at the time, as I remember, spent a Saturday afternoon raking leaves or something for our neighbor. And our very generous neighbor, at the end of that time, gave him the astronomical sum of $5 for his efforts. The next day was Sunday, came to church. We had one campus at the time, East Campus. And after church, I took this particular son, as I often did, across the road to the little convenience store, a little tradition, just to pick up a little treat for the way home after a long Sunday morning. But his money was kind of burning a hole in his pocket. So uh, we got into the store. He said, Dad, can I buy something with my own money? I said, sure, bud. It's your money. Have at it. So he walked, wanders off, comes back in a few minutes with a candy bar, which I expected, and with something I did not expect. A little paper rose flower in a plastic tube. You've seen those little paper flowers? I said, what's that for? And he said, I want to give it to mom. And then I said, for reasons I still don't fully understand, I said, but it's two ninety nine. dollars You won't have much left. A <laughs> couple of questions. First, what is wrong with me? Secondly... Why would I possibly want to discourage my son from giving such a sweet gift to his mom, who happens to be my wife? Even selfishly speaking, wouldn't I get a little bounce back credit for that? She might think I put him up to it or something. But I said that, what I said. Well, he got it anyway. Main question is this. What was it about my son's desire to give an extravagant gift, more than half of his net worth, to his mother as an act of love? What made me uncomfortable about that? We're in a summer series now called What's in a Word? Ten transformational verbs in the New Testament. And if you've noticed, week by week, we're using the word search on the front of your bulletin to identify which words we have talked about, which ones we're going to talk about. But some of you have found other words in there. Some of you guys have told me on the first line, going left to right, you've seen another word there. And you're wondering about it. It's F-I-S-H. That's not one of our transformational words for this summer, just so you know. I want to make that clear. We have talked about these words, however. We've talked about believe. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you will be saved. We talked about the word love. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as atoning sacrifice for our sins. We talked about forgive. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. We talked about worship. In Hebrews 12, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is the consuming fire. Then last week, Pastor Ali Kalkandelan from Turkey spoke to us about the word pray. Now, he didn't refer to this verse specifically, but here's our verse for pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, very simple, three words. I think you can memorize it today. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Remember he said you can't have quality prayer without quantity prayer? Now today our word is give. In Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this in verse 37 and 38. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And then this. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now here's what I want you to try to commit to memory It'll take some time, it's a little bit longer verse, but read it with me, look at the screen. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Here's the essence of the teaching. Give, and it will be given to you. Now here at FBCG, most of you know we celebrate generosity in all its forms. The giving of time, the giving of talent, the giving of service, the giving of resources. We also believe that God wants us each to grow in the areas of generosity. That's why we created this little graphic to picture what we call the generosity pathway. It's a little hard to read. We're working on another version of this right now. But it begins with first steps, just getting started in a life of generosity. We noticed this past ministry year from September to this month, that we've had 130 uh, families give their first gift, financial gift, FECG, 130 families. And if that's you, we thank you. We celebrate what God's doing in and through you. And then there's the step called consistent generosity. We know that many of you have chosen our online giving option as a way to become more consistent in your giving. My family and I have done that over the last five or six years. It was a great help to us. And then there's the step of proportional generosity, we know that the average, on average, the families of FBCG have, uh, have uh, increased their giving by 17% in the past year. That's an extraordinarily encouraging statistic, proportional giving. And then there's extravagant giving. Sort of, the, sort of the, the goal, the end goal is to become extravagant 
people. Here's a story you may not know about. A few months ago, we were notified that an elderly widow in our congregation had passed away. Uh, she had uh, not been able to worship with us for uh, almost a decade, I believe, due to health reasons. But when she passed away, we were notified that she had left a gift to FVCG of what's going to amount to a close to $100,000. There's nothing more powerful than an extravagant gift. But that's not where I want to begin today. I want to back up and talk about the why, why we are generous. I want to talk about the genesis of generosity. And we're going to begin here. First, God is generous. God is generous. A few weeks ago, we played a little game in our family dinner table. I think one of our boys brought, in fact, I know one of our boys brought it up. It's a, it's a game called Would You Rather. You ever played that game? Somebody asks a question, would you rather, and then gives two wildly different options, and you have to choose which one you would rather, and then say why. And here was the question we had the most fun with. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Okay, just blink reaction. How many would like to speak every language in the world? How many of you like to talk to animals? <laughs> I asked that question to my brother, who's a pastor in Ohio, and he said, well, what if you chose the speaking to animals thing, and then you found out that animals were really dumb? <laughs> he said, you see a squirrel, you go, hey, buddy, what's up? And he goes, nut, 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 and that's all there is. He'd be kind of disappointed. <laughs> but it got me thinking about animals. Did you know there are over 1,300,000 species of animals on the earth today, including some really weird ones like a hammerhead shark? I mean, what in the world? How about this guy? <laughs> that's not your Uncle Charlie. That's called a proboscis monkey. And one more. This is called a red-lipped batfish. Now, be honest with me. How many of you knew that existed in the world? How many? Anybody? There, were, there was one in one service, and I think they were lying. I'm not really sure you believe that. No. I looked it up. Red-lipped batfish. Now, why? Why do these strange creatures exist? Why did God go through so much trouble to create these creatures that live so deep we never even see them unless somebody goes down there and finds them? Well, I think they are examples of God's extraordinary generosity. I think all of creation bears witness to God's love and generosity. You see, sometimes I think we have kind of a default mode way of thinking about God and that is that he's just a little on the stingy side. Now, we don't say it out loud, especially not in church, but I think we think it sometimes. That he's kind of holding back a little bit. That he's not giving us everything that we need and particularly that we want. For example, most of us have a car or two in the driveway. It's hard to live in our culture without a car. I mean, some people live without cars, but most of us have a car. Let's say you have a car. And your car's got an engine, four decent tires, gets about 25 miles to a gallon. It's got an AM, FM radio, a CD player. It's got a place to plug in your iPhone. Uh, it's got air conditioning, power windows. And it's got a GPS system that talks to you and tells you where to turn. Okay? But then, and you're good with that. You're grateful, you know. Got a car. And then you look up and you realize you don't have a sunroof in your car. And you're like, I really always wanted to have a sunroof. Why don't I have a sunroof? God, you run the whole universe. You can't give me a sunroof? What's up with that? Now, that's not a God problem, is it? That's more of a spoiled, rotten child problem. At our house, we have five cars over a million miles total, and I'm very vulnerable to that kind of thinking, right? Generosity in the Bible starts in Genesis. In Genesis 2, we are told that God gave Adam, the first being he created with his own hands, the gift of the breath of life, the ruah, the spirit of God, the only creature to have that gift. He gave Adam a garden to live in, everything he needed, watered, pl plants for food. Then he gave Adam a work to do, subdue the earth, name all the animals. And then he gave him a life partner. He gave him a woman. Genesis 2, 24 says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And by the way, that's the first time God defines marriage as one man and one woman in a covenant relationship for life, and it stays consistent throughout Scripture. God is generous because he gives good things. In Psalm 103, we read one of my favorite psalms, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. What benefits? What are the benefits? Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. In the New Testament, in the book of James, we read that every good and perfect gift, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Now, we think of God as creator, 
quite normally. We think of God as powerful and sovereign. We think of God as holy and glorious, especially when we worship together. But do we think of God as generous? As the generous giver of all good things. The most generous being in the universe. He's given us all of creation as a gift. He's given us every good thing. And then ultimately, the Bible says, he gave us himself. John 3.16, the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is the gift, of course, of Jesus. This is the gift of the gospel through which we have the gift of eternal life. God is generous. Secondly, the gospel itself is generous. The gospel is generous. I am continually surprised by how many people outside of the church and even sometimes inside the church think of Christianity backwards. That is, they have a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel. Let me try to explain. First, many people, maybe even someone here today, thinks of the Christian faith primarily as a religion. Now you're thinking, well, duh, isn't it a religion? I mean, you have Islam, you have Buddhism, you have Judaism, you have Christianity, great world religions, right? Well, not exactly. See, Jesus didn't come preaching a new religion. He didn't recruit people to be part of his new organization. He didn't establish a bunch of rules for membership. He said... Follow me. Follow me. And by the way, Jeff and I are putting the finishing touches on our preaching plan for all next year. That'll launch late in August. It's going to be called The Story of Jesus. We're going to preach through the Gospels. We're very excited about it. We look forward to it. We're going to learn a lot more about what Jesus came to preach and teach. He invited people into a relationship with himself. He invited people to participate in what he called the kingdom of God. Now, religion is what has grown up around what Jesus taught. Now, religion is not necessarily bad, but religion tends to set up barriers. It tends to be about us and them, insiders and outsiders, and that's not the gospel. The gospel is not primarily about a religion. It's about relationship. He said, follow me. Second, many people tend to think of the Christian faith as being primarily about making us better people, that it's about moral improvement, to help us be a little more kind, to be more compassionate, to not cut people off in traffic, to give our spare change to homeless people, you know, that sort of thing. And all those are good things, but they're not the primary purpose of the gospel. They're byproducts of the gospel. The primary purpose of the gospel is death and the resurrection, the power to make spiritually dead people live again. Thirdly, many people tend to think of the Christian faith as being mostly about what Christians don't do or don't believe in. When I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, it was Christians don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, don't go to movies, don't play cards, and so forth. And that kind of superficial legalism led people outside the church to see us as people who have no fun, that the gospel takes away adventure, takes away passion, that the gospel makes us joyless and judgmental people, and on top of all that, we're boring. Not true. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it, what? More abundantly. More abundantly was Jesus' goal. That's not boring. That's not passionless. In fact, G.K. Chesterton, an English writer, philosopher back in the early part of the 20th century, has one of my favorite quotes. He said this, the more I consider Christianity, I found that while it has established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. I love that quote, to give, to give room for good things to run wild. That's because the gospel is wildly generous. The gospel is the gift of grace and salvation. In Ephesians 2, the apostle Paul writes, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now think about the wildness, the magnitude of this gift. He said, You can't work for this gift. It's a gift. You can't deserve it. You can only receive it. Now think about that. That means you don't have to be religious to receive this gift. You don't have to give a certain amount of money in the plate to receive this gift. You don't have to have a perfect Sunday school attendance pen to get this gift. You don't have to go on a mission trip to get this gift. You don't even have to be good. That's 
grace. That's the whole point. Now, grace is to produce transformation. Grace does produce good things, but grace comes first. It's wildly generous. Secondly, the gospel is also the gift of forgiveness. Now, we talked about the word forgive earlier in the summer. We saw that to forgive is always a gift. In Ephesians 1, Paul writes again, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I love that word, lavished. It reminds me of what we tend to do with our children, especially when they're younger at birthday times. We lavish them with attention, balloons and cakes and gifts and enough ice cream to make them sick. We lavish them. God lavishes on us what? His forgiveness, his grace, a wildly generous gift. And the gospel promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The moment you open your heart in faith to the gospel, to Jesus Christ, you receive three gifts instantaneously. The gift of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, and the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell in your heart and live with you forever. God is generous. The gospel itself is generous. That's the genesis of generosity. And thirdly, our generosity is the result of gospel transformation. It's the result of transformation. Over the 4th of July weekend, our family took a trip to North Dakota because my wife's side of the family has kind of a farm that's been the sort of the spiritual center of their home for a century, really. So we drove 840 miles one way from Chicago to this little town outside of Bismarck. You drive north through Wisconsin, north through Minnesota. You get to Minneapolis, you turn left, and you drive the rest of the way, 840 miles to North Dakota. You know what we saw on the way? Nothing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Actually, we saw mile after mile of American farms. That's what it looks like from here to North Dakota, with the exception of one little pocket in Minneapolis. You know, we who live in the suburbs, suburbs think the whole world is suburbs, right? No, the whole world looks like that. You could take all of Chicago, put it in the middle of North Dakota, you'd never find it again. Be just lost. Okay? Mile after mile of soybeans, corn, wheat, alfalfa, hay, sunflowers. How many of you grew up on a farm? Anybody here grew up on a farm? Well, I got to thinking about farmers. You got a lot to think about when you drive 840 miles in one day through that. I was thinking about farmers. What would that life be like? What's the life of a farmer like? Hard work. Relentless hard work. Patience. Patience. And then I thought of the word generosity. Probably, was, probably because I was thinking about this message and thinking about Scripture. Generosity. Why generosity? Can you imagine a stingy farmer? Can you imagine a farmer with his bag of seed? I don't know if it comes in bags or not, but he's going, I got this much seed, but I really can't afford to plant that much of it because I need to have some for my, I need to keep some. I can't plant. No, farmers don't think like that. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Farmers understand that principle. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Great passage. God loves a cheerful giver. Now, we know God loves everyone. God is love. But what does this mean? I think it means that generous people, cheerful givers, make God's heart glad in a special way. Why? I think it's because cheerful givers or generous people understand who he is. They understand his generosity. They know everything is a gift. And because they understand and have experienced the gospel makes his heart glad. A few years ago, we did a series called Generosity. We called it Freedom from the Smallness of Heart. You might, some of you might have the t-shirts. Generosity is freedom from smallness of heart. Think about what the gospel does for us. What does the gospel do? It sets us free. It sets our hearts free from condemnation, free from the fear of punishment, free from the consequences of our own sin, free from the fear of death. It sets our hearts free. Let me say three things about the gospel and generosity. First, the gospel is designed to produce generous people. In fact, more than that, I would say the gospel truly experienced always produces generous people. Always. Remember Saul of Tarsus, central character in our book of Acts preaching for a whole year? 
Saul of Tarsus, religious in every way, but saw religion as us and them, insiders, outsiders. If you don't believe like me, like me, I hate you, I persecute you, and I kill you if I have an opportunity. Transformed by the wildness of the grace of Christ, light on the road to Damascus, becomes Paul the apostle, spends the rest of his life pouring his life out as a relentless sower of the seed of the gospel so that anyone who hears can experience the same grace. The gospel's designed to produce generous people. Secondly, generous people bear witness to the gospel. Now, I want to be careful here. Generosity is a good thing in, in all its forms. I read recently that Bill Gates has given away $26 billion in his lifetime, and he's going to give away many, many more billions. That's a good thing. Generosity is a good thing, but that doesn't mean he's a follower of Jesus. Flip it around. On the other hand, it's almost impossible for a follower of Jesus to bear witness to the gospel without generosity. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. One of the ways we do that is through this word, give. Thirdly, generous people change the world. That is, the gospel transforms people and transform people make an impact in the world. By giving time, hundreds of you will serve in our children's ministry starting up in the fall. Dozens of you served recently in our buddy break ministries. We set a record with a number of children with special needs and families with special needs served on a Saturday by just by giving your time. Some will give your talents. Dozens of you serve in our Shepherd's Heart Ministry, the food pantry at the East Campus. And that's now blossomed into more than that. Financial counsel offered on Wednesday nights. Dozens are sitting with their talents and finances, helping people solve their family financial issues, giving their talents. And then there's giving your treasure. From a widow leaving in her estate an extravagant gift to our own VBS kids raising over $3,000 in one week to buy wheelchairs, nothing more powerful than an extravagant gift. Generous people change the world. Way back in 1982, and I've told this story before, but it's been a long time, I did an internship for seven weeks in an inner city church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was wrestling with my direction. I was single, hadn't been to seminary yet. Wonder what God had for me. So my dad arranged this internship for seven weeks in Pittsburgh. And this is one of the reasons why I believe so strongly in what we call the FBCG Leadership Institute. We have 11 paid interns this summer, all college students, post-college students, wrestling with whether God's calling them into ministry. I think we need to do more of that to train up the next generation of leaders. Part of it's this memory I have about Pittsburgh. Well, I went there not knowing what I would do. The pastor said, I want you to get to know the Hmong family and their kids. You might not know who the Hmong are. The Hmong are people who live in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos. They fled that nation under the genocide that happened under the Viet Cong and the Khmer Rouge back in the 70s and early 80s. They relocated into the slums of North America. So there was a whole community of Hmong people living in the slum right across from the city park where the church was. Okay, so I'll try to do that. I remember the first couple nights I was in this apartment in the church. I looked down at night, 10, 11 o'clock at night in the darkness and see these lights bobbing up and down in the city park. Too big to be fireflies, but I wonder what they were. Who's doing this every night? Who's out there with lights? Finally, I got up the courage. I went down there, and I found the Hmong women and children with flashlights creeping along the ground, digging up night crawlers, worms, putting them into empty milk jugs because they had discovered there's three rivers in, Pens in Pittsburgh. They could sell them to the wharfs and the fishermen for $7 a gallon. They were augmenting their income by digging up worms. $7 a gallon. Remember that. I'll come back to it later. So I got to know these kids, young teenagers from these Hmong families, 15 of them or so. One of them was a little boy named Neng. He was 14 years old, about this tall. Neng was a problem. He was angry. He had outbursts. He loved to shout curse words just to get my attention, to, to get attention. He was an angry, difficult, disruptive boy. Hard to have him around. I didn't know what to do with him. So slowly, when I had chances, I'd just walk along with him or ask him questions, and I slowly, over about a week or two, dragged out a little bit of his story. When he was 12, he saw his father murdered, shot to death in front of his home in Laos. Then, a few months after that, his family had to flee under persecution, fled, swam across the Mekong River, which was three miles wide where he swam across it. He coughed up blood from his lungs. It was so difficult. Almost died in the river. He was being shot at by soldiers. When I was 12, I was playing Little League Baseball. So I got to know why he was the way he was. 
Slowly, he allowed a relationship to be formed. He was still a handful, but I got to know him a little bit. Seven weeks go by, did lots of stuff, got to know these kids, and uh, I had to go back to my, I had to go back to school. So I packed up my stuff. We had a, we had a party one night with ice cream. The kids all went away, said our goodbyes. Packing up, two hours later, about 11 o'clock at night, I hear my name being called from the sidewalk downstairs outside the church. Who's out there at 11 o'clock at night? Went, I looked down on my window, and it was Neng with his little stingray bicycle he always rode and his hat on backwards. He was yelling at me to come down. So I went down, not knowing what he was going to do. When I got down there, very quickly, he said, this for you, maybe you get some food. And he handed me an envelope. And then he rode off into the night, and I never saw him again. I stood there for a long time with that envelope because I was afraid to open it. When I did open it, there was a $10 bill inside. I knew what it had cost him to get that $10. As I reflect on that over 34 years ago, I realize I gave just a little bit of my time that summer, just a little bit of time. What he gave me was a, an extravagant gift of love and generosity. And I never forgot it. I think that's what Jesus means when he said, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Give. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, thank you so much for your word today and for this simple word, give. First, we need to thank you for your own great generosity toward us, for the gift of grace we receive through the gospel. Use it to penetrate our hearts, set our hearts free so that we can be a people known not just for what we believe or not just for what we do not do, but as a people of your own extravagant generosity. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.